what is the problem with pointers? What is the nightmare with pointers? Like when we talk about pointers, to? To manage them. What does it mean? Hold it. What does it mean, manage them? Well, like to manage the uh, memory that like we have, like we have to just like kind of when we assign a pointer or like create a yeah, pointer. Yeah, the problem is that we forget to, we forget to deallo deallocate them, right? That's the main problem that we have with pointers, that we allocate something and then we deallocate them. So, so you don't need to do anything. Yeah. It's not a walkie-talkie, it's just a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to push anything to, the, 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 light, the light is on. Good. So, uh, so the problem that we have with pointers is that um, uh, we forget to deallocate what we allocate. And it's not that we forget. Sometimes the path through allocation and deallocation goes so deep inside different types of logics that it's going to be difficult to actually track and see what we want to do if we have deallocated something or not. And we go through all these rules and regulations to make sure that do, when you actually allocate, we've got to say, make sure everything is null before it is. And then um, check to see if uh, the thing is allocated. And I keep going through all these things. But essentially, we have two types of mem memory allocation that we deal with. Number one is that we create a pointer and we allocate some memory in that pointer. And then we don't want to pass that around. We don't want. We don't want another pointer to point to that one. We want only this pointer to point to it. And when I want something else to point to it, I don't want this old pointer to point to it anymore. I want to move the things around. I don't want five things to point at the same thing at the same time. That's scenario number one, where you have a pointer, you allocate something, you give that memory, you give it to someone else. That one uses that memory and it goes. It's so the, the, the resource goes from place to place. And at the end, it's deallocated. That's numero uno, right? The second one. The second one is that you allocate something and you point to it. And you do something with it over here. And you pass it around somewhere else. And they are using it too. And five different pointers are pointing to the same location to get stuff out of it. And you want to make sure the last one going, going out actually wipe out the memory because the, there are five different people using it. When I say people, I mean pointers. Five different pointers using it. And you need to make sure that the last person going out actually deleting it. So these are the two scenarios that we have. And they said, we have all the resources. And as soon as all the uh, operator overloading and everything um, comes to play, we see that we have the resources that actually accomplish this through all the uh, things we learned down to this point. We learned how to create wrappers and things like that, right? And wrap functions into a class and pass it around so the functions can be passed around. Why can't we have something like that for pointers? So what we did to demonstrate how it works, uh, I'm going to have uh, A lady, can you see that? Okay. Are we okay? How about now? No? Now? Now? That was the minimum. <laughs> so this was the minimum, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. I want, the, I want real estate. I want to have some space to work with. So I have uh, an employee over there that holds stuff and and I'm showing it. So it's a simple class that I want to have in, in my example. So what I want to do is to write a class that takes care of pointers for me. So I don't have to worry about uh, deleting things. I want C++ kind of act like Java, where it does the garbage collection, but in a smart way. Okay. You know what the garbage garbage collection? You know what the garbage collection of Java is, right? No. So you allocate memory in Java. You don't delete anything. And as the program is running, the system pauses and says, "Let me see if you are, have any memories that you are not using," and it deletes them. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, we don't want that. We want it to get deleted properly in a proper time. We don't want it to just pause everything and do a cleanup. So what we do, uh, we create a class. Obviously, we create a template because we want to have different types of pointers. So we have a template, and that template of ours uh, receives some kind of a type. And uh, let's call that uh, UPTR. Why I call it U? Because I want this class of mine that is supposed to wrap a pointer, I want it to be a unique one, which means if I pass this thing around and I set one pointer to another, I want the resources of one to move to another one. I don't want the, uh, the whole uh, uh, scenario over here to, uh, I don't want two pointers to be able to point at the same location at the same time. Now for that, uh, obviously I need a pointer. There is no question about that. Okay, and uh, uh, we set it like this. So, so when I create a pointer, it's null. That's a good thing about it. I don't have to make it null, right? So what else I need to do? I need to be able to set this pointer. So I'm going to say UPTR. I'm going to create the constructor for it. That's type that is passed to it. And that's the pointer that I get. And immediately what I do over there, I'm going to initialize the MPTR of mine to uh, what's coming in. So essentially, I'm going to uh, uh, um, um, initialize it with a PTR, right? You OK with this? So I get it, and I set it up. So, so far, so good. I, I have the pointer, and I'm keeping it. Then I'm going to say I do not want this pointer to be able to be two pointers to point at the same place. Um, how can I do that? The only thing I need to do is to prevent this thing to be able to be copied or assigned to anything else. I know how that, how that thing is done. So I go UPTR, uh, constant UPTR reference, and I'm going to say that's equal to delete, right? First thing, copy constructor cannot happen. Copy assignment is the same thing. So I'm going to go uh, whatever. It doesn't matter what is the return type, right? Pointer, oh, sorry, UPT uh, uh, operator equal const UPTR auth. Const UPTR reference, and I want that one to be the same. Right? So this prevents a one pointer to be set to another and uh, anything to get copied. But I want to be able to move these things around. So I want copying to happen, but instead of copying, I want move to happen. So obviously, uh, the answer is to create uh, a move constructor and um, get whatever pointer that I have. Um, what do I do? Um, PTR. <laughs> okay, so so I'm going to uh, get the pointer that I have that I want to uh, um, uh, pass it to the next one. Obviously, it's no exception. And what I will do over here, I'm going to say the pointer that I have will be uh, essentially uh, holding the, uh, the pointer of the, uh, the address of the other one. And what I will do, I'm going to make that pointer to, uh, uh, to be null. Right? So when one points to another, it's, you're right, UP is better. It's all about naming, eh? All right, <laughs> so now if I copy one, th what this thing that is being copied, the address will go to the curtain, to the one that is, the one that is being copied will go to the one that is being copied into, and the one that is being copied will be null. So essentially, move around. And for assigning one to another,
Um, that's going to be uh, UPTR again, right? So we're going to go UPTR, UP. And what we need to do, obviously, no exception. And what we need to do over here is to first, because now I am assigning one to another, this one might be pointing to something. I don't want that to happen. I don't want two things. So, so I have to get. So this is where this pointer doesn't need deleting anymore. All the other pointers, if you're setting one pointer to another, first you have to delete the target. Then you have to set it, right, to make sure you don't have any memory leak. So I'll take care of that over here. So that prevents the memory leak. I'm going to say delete what you are pointing at right now. Now that you have deleted, I can actually set you to the ups.mptr and make ups.mptr be equal to null pointer and return this, right? So, so far, I can set a pointer to something. So I can say uptr whatever, set it to, yes. No, because the other one has it. Deep breath. This class is supposed to represent a pointer. So I'm going to say this class pointer is equal to new whatever. This is going to replace a regular pointer that you have. In a pointer, you don't have any construction or destruction. You say integer pointer p is equal to new int, correct? Your pointer is just responsible to hold the address of something dynamic. This is what we are doing. So this is not responsible to, to, to create something. It's just keep, supposed to keep track of what is dynamic. It depending, depending. Yes, that's going to cause trouble. OK. So sure. Okay, so the next thing we want to do, we want this to act like a regular pointer. So when I say target of, it goes to the target. When I say address of, it goes to the address. I still want that to happen. So <coughs> if I want that to happen, what do I do? I'm going to say T uh, uh, reference, give me a reference if operator target of is used, right? And then in here, I'm going to say return target of MPTR, right? And for the other one, I'm going to go return the address if the, the redirection address uh, pointer is used. So if they actually use it for the, to, to uh, uh, point to something, um, they, they, they need to be able to get the address. And for that case, I'm going to return uh, return MPTR. OK? Now, if somebody wants to extract, extract the address out of this and see what is the raw address, I can actually do that. So I can actually say operator uh, const void, void pointer. So if they actually uh, want to cast this to a void pointer, what I need to do is to return uh, a static cast. cast of uh, uh, const void pointer, and I'm going to return the MPTR. So if they want to extract the address as a void thing, I can do it for them. And at the end, what I will do, I'm going to say my, my, my UPTR, when it's getting destructed, I want it to be able to delete that MPTR. So what happens by creating something simple like this 
this can replace the pointers as I used before. So essentially what I can do is something like this. Okay, I am creating a, point, uh, a pointer to an employee and I'm gonna set it to new employee of yada yada yada. Okay, you can put equal in front of it if you, that makes you happy, it doesn't make any difference, right? I can create a pointer to an integer, I can create whatever, and then I can use it exactly like I'm using a pointer, no difference. But if I actually set that pointer and move another pointer to this one, the pointer that I have right now will have the data moved into it. It is not going to, uh, the other one is not gonna be uh, uh, pointing to it. And, and, I went, and I, when I get to the end, I don't need to worry about deleting anything anymore. Because when any of these things go out of scope, the constructor will delete my, my values. And therefore, I'm home free. I don't have to worry about the pointers anymore. We call these smart pointers. Okay, so, and this is called a unique pointer because one thing will take care of all the, okay? So, um, yeah, and uh, running it is the exact, so. Uh, yeah, so as you see over here, as soon as, let me just walk through it. So over here, the pointer is created. There's no point to go with because there's nothing complicated over there. So when I say target of PTR, it goes over there and it actually gets the reference of the target of MPTR as is. And obviously, it's going to set the value. If I say show the target of PTR, it goes to the target and again returns the reference and therefore the value is printed. And the same thing for the other one, for the, for the employee one. Exactly the same thing. And uh, when I move one to another, now PTR2 will actually point to what PTR had, and the old PTR is absolute, it's nothing, it's null, and therefore it's going to say PTR is null. And uh, um, I can print the value of the other one, move PTR2 to PTR back again, and show it it's the exact same thing, and move PTR3 to PTR, and the same thing, absolutely no difference. And I can move the value of the pointer for employee to tax to be displayed. So it actually comes up and moves P to the, uh, uh, to the tax function. Therefore, E over here will point to the employee. And as soon as it's done, see what happens. Now the employee gets out and it deletes. And when it comes back in, the P over here, let's actually go to it. This one, you see, it's not, it's not gonna get deleted. I don't know which one is that, but all the things are gonna get, uh, uh, try to delete. Whichever has, have something in them, this one has it, so this one is deleted, and the ones that are not, uh, they're just ignoring it. So therefore, I'm not gonna have any memory leak. So having something like this, I do not need to worry about uh, um, uh, how uh, a unique pointer can point to something and the dynamic memory allocation for it will be done perfect. Now, uh, this is the easy one. Smart pointer, for unique pointers implementation is easy. Problem is with the shared one. If you want to implement a shared one, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult, okay? Yes. Because, because you want it not to be able to be copied. You want to enforce that the pointer that you have will not, this becomes the most efficient one with respect to time. So you don't want anything to get copied. You don't want three different things to point to the same thing. You want to make sure that you pass the information from one to another and the old one will not have it. It all depends on how you are. As I mentioned, you have two different types of looking at it. You, have, you want to write a program that three things can point to the same 
one or not. So I'm going to do the, the other one and you'll see what happens. So with a shared pointer, <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, develop it step by step. I'm just going to show it to you how it's handled. So it's the same thing. I have the, I have the, the employee thingy over there. But now over here, I want to actually uh, create something so I can have many things pointing to each other, which means the, the shared pointer of mine, that's going to be tricky. I'm going to explain first what happens. When you have a unique pointer, it's easy because you are passing. It's impossible because the move, because the copy constructor and copy assignment, they're deleted. It is impossible for two of them to point to the same thing. If you don't move it, it's going to give you an error. With the share pointer, you may have six different one pointing, and you have no way to know how many. And you cannot use a static variable, if you are thinking of it, to count how many objects you have, because static variable is shared between all types. But that's not the case. You need to be able to keep track of each pointer pointing to its own individual address. And that's going to cause trouble. Because of that, what you need to do is something like this. So for your shared pointer, what you need to do is, first of all, you have your own, you have your uh, pointer. That's very fine. But instead of actually having, instead of actually having uh, a static value over here, you need to have a counter outside of the shared pointer. Why? Because your shared pointer needs to keep track of how many instances are pointing to the same object. And that cannot be done for the entire class. It has to be done based on the object. Therefore, you are going to create a counter dynamically outside of the pointer and keep track of it to see how many of those things are actually uh, allocated. Give me a second. Suspected spam. OK, I just wanted to make sure that's not an important thing. Sorry, I have to have my cell phone on. All right. So how do we do that? How do we deal with this? <coughs> so what do you do? When the first time this thing is created, you need to check to see uh, if, uh, uh, first of all, you set the pointer to whatever it is. Then the pointer counter that you have, you are going to create a, a new instance out of it. But you're going to do that based on the, uh, the pointer that you have being null or not. If the pointer that you are receiving over here is null, then you put 0 over here. It means there is nothing in there. If the, if the pointer that you have over, have over here is actually pointing to something, you put 1 in in the size. So you, this pointer counter will be set to 0 if they just set the pointer to null. But if this shared pointer is actually pointing to something, there is something to be pointed to, it's going to be set to 1. OK? Then for your copy constructor, you don't delete it. You actually copy it. How, how, but you copy the pointer, not the target. So what happens is that you're going to keep track of where the thing is. And you're going to make the counter of that object that you are copying to be pointed to the same counter that is this one. So these two pointers will point to the same counter. OK? And then you say, if the pointer that I'm actually copying is not null, it's actually pointing to something, now I have two pointers pointing. So I add one to the counter. So it adds to the counter only if the target is an address. For the assignment, what happens is this. First of all, you check and make sure because it is being assigned to another one, right? You are saying, if this is not the same, the same thing that you reminded before the other one, we do it over here, then you're going to say wipe out. What wipe out does 
it's a smart type of deleting. What happens is that it goes through the counter, counts to see if this is the last one. If this is the last one, it will delete it. If not, it's not going to delete and only reduce the counter by one. Take a look at wipeout. So what wipeout does, it says if, the, if what I have is not null, reduce it by one. Then, if it's not null, because I don't want to write two things, and the target is not zero, which means it's not the last one, okay? If, uh, if it is the last one, if the target is zero, which means it is the last one, then delete the pointer and delete the counter, which means I'm done. If it's not, it's not going to get deleted, because just this object is going, this pointer is going, and still there are other pointers pointing to that location. So it essentially checks to see if all the shared ones are OK. So first it tries to wipe out because it's being set to something. Either the memory is going to get wiped or not. We don't care. Then it says, now let's uh, do uh, the assignment that we've done exactly like the other one. So we set it up. We set the counter. We add the counter. And we keep going like that. Yes. No, because you're not pointing to anything. It, remember, the, your job of, the job of your shared pointer is to make sure there is one piece of dynamic memory and there are 50 different pointers pointing to them. When one of them is going out of scope, it needs to see if there are others pointing to that location or not. If others are not pointing to that location, then it wipes it out. If at least one is pointing over there, then it just let it be, and it just let it go. No. Wipeout will do that. Wipeout will do that in a smart way, right? Wipeout will do that. Okay. But this one is just, just adding one to the other one because you are assigning one to another. Moving and everything works exactly the same way, so I don't need to explain. Move is like a regular move constructor. It doesn't make any difference. It just, uh, uh, so for move constructor, it just uh, uh, copies everything uh, and passes it, uh, and which means it moves from one to another, and the other one gets null, so no problem with it. For assignment, it's the exact same thing. First, it wipes out, uh, then it, uh, copies the, the counter on everything, and then make sure that uh, the dying object over there has everything set to null, OK? Because if, if it doesn't do that, then the other one tries to, uh, it will be counted as uh, one that is pointing, which is not. Because it's a move, it's supposed to set the other one. And we can actually see how many are counting right now. And the rest is the same. And in the destructor, we simply wipe out. OK? So it's the same thing over there like with the employee that I have. But the difference over here is that now I'm using a, uh, a shared pointer. So when I go through this, oh, it was, I didn't stop the other one. Just a second. Let's do it one more time. Okay. Why is it not showing it? Okay, let me just let me run it again. This doesn't make sense. Do I have another one? So a new integer is getting created, and as soon as it gets created, uh, um, I'm going to have A, and in here actually tells me that is actually pointing to one integer now. And then we're going to display the integer that's, that's one. Now I have two and three of them, and when I now look at three over here, we'll see that there are actually three of them over here. 
So every single copy adds to the number of shared pointers. And uh, uh, they are all uh, working the same way. And when you move one to another, obviously, it remains three, which means you can decide to move from one shared pointer to another. It remains three. Um, and uh, it's the same. And the other one is null, so nothing got, because it got moved, there is nothing over there to print. And these are both 13. And um, now I create a shared employee for the, uh, shared pointer for the employee, and I have two of them right now, as you see, and they are both in, uh, both looking in the same way. Um, and again, the same thing over here. And um, this is the, um, uh, uh, the redirection operator that we have, so that's going to uh, show it the same way. There's no problem with that. And when it goes off, one by one, it's going to go through the wipeout and count the counters. It's now two, so it's going to actually reduce by one and then goes up, so that wipeout will not delete anything. And the second one is going to get destroyed, goes to wipeout. Now this is one, and now it's going to get deleted because it was the last one. And it deletes it and comes out, and like that, everything is going to get deleted properly with no uh, uh, memory. Yes? No, no, it wipes, like it data. wipes out, wipe out, wipes, wipe out, wipes out all the, uh, 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 wipes out uh, the data only if there is one over there. Yeah, but essentially, but essentially it, it clears the data of the current one too. So when I say wipe out, it means it sets the pointer of the current one to null and deletes the target if this is the last one. So constructor shares the address, then if the object that is actually shared is actually a not null one, it adds one to the count. Okay, so, but again, the good news is that you don't need to, the, the reason that I am giving you this is to really, you understand what is the difference when you are actually using the, uh, did I save this? The reason I wrote this is that uh, you don't need to worry about these things because because these are all implemented already for you. So all you need to do is to include memory and now use a smart point, a unique pointer. So when you say unique underline PTR, that's the unique pointer. And use it exactly the same way. So unique pointer is a unique pointer. That's within the library of C++. So that's CPP unique and we have the exact same thing or the shared pointer. So it's a shared PTR. You do the same. Okay. <clears throat> the the reason that I like to do this. is to put emphasis on, I do that with IPC when I'm teaching them string and show them how to do string copy. Then I say, you don't need to do it using string header file. To show that uh, not every single thing that you see in C++ is a very complicated task. They are easy stuff to implement, but their usage is vast, okay? so. Like this is not like multi-threading that you have to go, oh, this is a simple thing that somebody thought about, oh, I have to keep track of the pointers. Why don't I just write a template so it does it for me so I don't have to worry about it? And then that's that.
Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's that one. Uh, any questions before we start multi-threading? All right. Now, for that, I have to open the list of the stuff that I'm supposed to teach because uh, that's not that's not something that I can go through it off my brain. To where did I put it? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach parallel programming, a concurrency. What is the difference between them? Then we're going to go a little bit about the history. Uh, compiler optimization, hardware op optimization. We're going to go through threads, locks, mutexes, uh, atomics, uh, uh, threads with vectors, and uh, promise and a future. Okay? So how to make promise to keep it in future. Okay, so these are the things that, that I'm planning to go through. I don't think I can finish it. I, usually it doesn't happen. But essentially what we're going to do we're going to first understand what is parallel programming, what does it mean multi-threading, and all the good stuff that we have. Then after that, we're going to um, write sample program to see how it is and how things run faster when you are doing this or that one with parallel processing. And uh, uh, then, yeah, so let's stop at that point, and then we're going to go through. So, oh, what the devil is parallel processing? So, I think it was before 1998 that uh, C++ actually didn't have any capability of multi-threading. You had to actually down uh, get a third party library to be able to do something like that. And then after that, after C++11, I think, they added multi-threading into the library of, of C++. Um, and parallel processing. So how, how does parallel processing actually work? Um, the parallel processing is done when you have vast amount of information that you want to go through, and a linear process of taking, going through it is difficult. Uh, and let's put it like this. If I want to clean all the classes in the third floor it, uh, in here, and I have only one person doing it, it is easier, definitely I hire 10 people, and it's going to go 10 times faster, right? But I have to be able to tell to those 10 people now, person number one, you are going from room number one to 10. Number two goes from 11 to 20. I should organize them. I cannot just say, you 10 people, go do this stuff. It's going to be chaos. I have to divide the work between them and then ask them to do so. So That's when parallel processing actually comes to play. But parallel processing has been there for like forever. Like uh, they kind of simulate it. Now, I always give this example. It's a perfect example. Actually, I'm hungry. Giving this example will actually <laughs> make me go buy something. So <clears throat> when you are actually um, having burgers and fries, what you're doing, you're having lunch, right? So you get a bite of your, oh, I'm really hungry. You get, <laughs> you get a bite of your burger, okay? And then you pick a fries. And then have a couple of fries, sip of your drink, and then another bite. You never put the burger and a drink at the same time in your mouth, right? <clears throat> it happens one at a time, <laughs> correct? You can't do that. But somebody looking at you, you're having your lunch. It looks like you're having 
everything is getting reduced at the same time. The fries, the burger, and the drink from somebody from outside, if they just look at you, go back and come back, they see fries is less, burger is smaller, drink is halfway through. Look away, come back, and they say, and they look at and everything is done. In their view, you ate them all at once. In their view, you're putting your fries and a burger and a drink at the same time. This is called concurrency. This is not, uh, this is not parallel processing. So what we call this is, just want to make sure, yeah, that's concurrency. In concurrency, it looks like you're doing things faster, but you're doing things in parallel, but you're essentially doing kind of time sharing. So you're telling to CPU, wait, eat the fries, wait, take a bite, wait, sip, right? And it happens so fast that you see, see everything is going down. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's how it happened. But then came the uh, computers with several CPUs. So you had a computer, you actually had four CPUs at the same time. So they said, wait a minute. I can sit and have my burger and watch my favorite show at the same time. Now you're actually taking a bite and at the same time looking. Why? Because your processing unit is now two. You have your eyes and you have your mouth. At the time, you had only one processing unit that was your mouth. You can't have two things at the same time. Now you are watching the show and eating your lunch. And that's actually parallel processing. It means you're doing two things at the same time. So when your computer has only one CPU, or if you are in an environment, you're on, on a cloud, and they, they give you this uh, node and the node that you have is assigned only to have one CPU, that's what happens. Your multiprocessor thing, processing thingy that you have is actually running almost the same as not, if not slower than a linear one. Um, so whenever you are running a program, I have to give you this thing. So I'm, I'm gonna write you some samples over here and you will see uh, it may happen or not, I don't know. But sometimes you write a linear program, and then you write a multi-thread of the same linear program, and you see the multi-thread one is going slower than your linear. Because the, over, the overload of, of separating the tasks and managing the thread pulls and things like that is more expensive than actually going through all the things at the same time, then you will see that the linear one goes faster. But don't get discouraged. Don't think that happens all the time. When the bottleneck is something that is very slow. Let's say you are doing a linear read from a hard drive, and it's billions of records that you're reading. If you do that using a multi-processing thing that it goes faster because it caches it, you get a chunk in four different things, and each chunk that is coming goes to the process. The bottleneck is not anymore the uh, thread management and uh, the processing in there for. So uh, sometimes, as I mentioned, so to, uh, I know that students are going to come, I run that on my computer and I see your multi-thread is running slower and this one is running fast. So keep that in mind. So what happened after 1998 uh, when the C++ plus 11 thing came out and, and, and actually uh, uh, Thread management was added to C. They said that from now on, any program that you're going to run is going to be a multi-thread program. Well, because you're only writing one main, it's one thread. So your main is actually a thread that is just running. But you can add more threads. So when your main starts, you can give another function to your process, and you say, this is another thread, run it. So your program runs and poofs, get separated into two tasks that are running in parallel, okay, coming down. And then if you just let it go like that and these two don't come back together, when program ends, compiler is going to say, wait a minute, your program ends, but I see there are two loose ends instead of one. That's a crash. When you, set, when you add, when you add, <laughs> when you, when you add, 
<laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, so when you split it to two or more threads, at the end before your program ends, you must join them back in, OK? Because you start with one thread, one thread becomes the mother of all threads, which is your main. You branch all the threads in your main, but as soon as it's branched, it starts execution. You can't tell to a thread to start you instantiate a thread that it runs, OK? Where to join it back in? The place it was separated, branched. So if you are in function foo, and in your function foo you fire a thread, you have to bring it back in that one to make sure that you not lose it, unless you create a unique pointer type of a thing, and you pass your threads around with that so you know that your thread Going at the end before you, everything is so something like that. And we'll kind of come to that and you'll see exactly how. But <coughs> <coughs> creating a thread is not like a magical thing, it's not a difficult thing to do actually, it's uh, quite simple. So you need a couple of, you need one thing just to be included, and that's thread, okay? So I'm going to have a function that prints a 100 characters, OK? Then in main, I'm going to do this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say over here, I'm going to have a thread. OK? So remember bind? How did bind work? You wanted to bind something to hub. What did you do? You passed the function name to the bind. You, you passed the function pointer, whatever you have, to the bind. And you bind arguments to it. Bind bound the function to a specific thing. So when you call it, specific value is passed to it. Thread works like, a, like bind. So what happens is that you pass the function. And what you want to pass to the function, to the thread, and you tell to the thread, shoo, the thread runs. OK? So you create a thread. <sighs> say tx. And in here, I'm going to say this is a thread. That accepts the foo and passes it, say, uh, the carrot thingy to it. OK? So what happens over here, this tx of mine immediately runs now. And it's going to execute that. And then after it's done, I have to say tx.join. Join it back in. So this is the simplest thing that you can write. So what happens if I run this program? We'll see this. Right? My main was one thread. And this one was another thread that called foo, right? So two threads are happening. Let's test this. What if I say over here? Something like uh, this is running foo, right? So this thread is running foo with caret. My main thread is running foo with underline, right? Let's see what happens. If it was a regular program, foo would have run with all the threads, all the carrots, and then the next foo will run with underline. That, right? But when you are doing parallel processing, you know what's interesting? <laughs> Once it actually happened, OK? Because it's a multi-thread thing, it all depends on how the CPUs are working. 
sometimes they run parallel, but sometimes one CPU is on hold and the other is so. So it's completely random. Once I actually did actually like that, I always said, that didn't make any difference, but give me a second. Let's <laughs> That's what happens. So as you see, <coughs> and let me just, you see this output? Take a look. Take a look. Every time it's a different shape, I cannot, I cannot say. Because, because now, and uh, you see this is in second line, right? But this is actually running first. <laughs> You can never say this might. So these are all both running at the same time. And that's multi-threading in a simple thing. So I can have two processes happening and doing the same thing, uh, doing, uh, doing two different things, and I make, it, make them join. So um, to show you better, I'm going to actually have these things happening in a function and then call the thread several times in main. Now, my question is, let me run it. And this is what happens, right? Four times it's running, and each time it's running in a different way. And they are all joining back in this thread. So, so it starts up over here. It starts one, two, three. This is happening in, in the main thread. So it's calling foo in main thread. It's not in a separate thread than main. So this is actually running. It joins them back and then comes back, does it again, over and over. So the processes are happening uh, in a parallel. Are we OK with this? Of course, the three of them are happening at the same time. If I didn't print it, <laughs> because the bottleneck is printing now, probably they are running the exact same amount of time. Remember, that was an amazing question, actually. <clears throat> if I just, but the thing is that then how you want to print, it's not going to be random anymore, OK? But if, I, but if I printed these three, OK? If I put, put these three back to back and it wasn't in a thread, would it run faster like this than the other one? The answer is no. Why? Because no matter how fast they are going to try to do their process, they have to wait to print on a screen. And because print on a screen, it almost has the same amount of time, the time these things are running and a regular thing, absolutely no different. It's got to be the same, actually. OK? So. OK. Amazing question. Um, I just looked at my thing and I saw that five different things that I wanted to follow I didn't actually mention. <laughs> but, but let me just go through this first. Um, is it a uh, um, uh, limit to the number of threads? The thing is that if you pass through it, then it turns to concurrency, not parallel anymore. So you could have done this. You can do this in a single CPU machine, no problem. But there is a command that you can run through threads that tells you actually how many cores do you have. So you can actually run to that amount. I'll show you that one. Too. So <clears throat> when you are writing a parallel processing thingy, you can, before you start, you can see how many things are there. If you see there's only one CPU, you don't do it. If the answer is one, you don't do anything. But if it tells you, because um, it's not the number of CPUs these days. You can have one CPU with eight cores, and you have four CPUs like that, you have 32 cores. So you are running in 32 parallel things. It's not the number of CPUs that you never know how many things you have. OK? Remember CPUs came out with hyper-threading capabilities? No? OK. No. Anyway. <laughs> OK, so another thing I wanted to mention is about compiler optimization and hardware optimization before I go to the next one. So this is an example of, very simple example of, of, of multi-threading. And remember, if we, we, we uh, 
Is it going up and down, or, I, or I'm getting this? <laughs> I feel like it's going like this. Anyway, so this, uh, if I miss any of these joins over here, then I'll be in trouble. OK? Careful. It's a long story. I know. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I'm what I'm about to say is this. So you write a program, okay? You write a program, and we don't need any of these. In your program, you set a variable to ten, okay? Then you say sleep for hundred milliseconds. Then you set the variable to twenty. Then you sleep 200, right? Then you set the var to 30. So you're writing something like this. The compiler is going to say, why? I'm just going to set var to 10, sleep for 200 sec uh, 300 milliseconds, and set it to 30. OK, so optimization like this happens in compiler. OK? So Sometimes things that you write, and this is a very simple thing to write, but sometimes you write complex tasks. And when you actually walk through it, and do you see when you actually, when it comes out and you have debugging stuff happening, and you see, wait a minute, what, why I did that? But sometimes don't trust what you write. When the compiler finds it fits, it says, oh, well, I don't care what you write. This is more optimized. I'm going to write it this way. Number two, that's compiler optimization. That's software opt optimization. You have hardware optimization, where is you have a piece of memory, and you write something in that piece of memory, and then you do few processes on that piece of memory in the CPU, and then you write back on the memory, piece of memory that you have, and then you continue you do a series of other processes on the exact same location, and then you, and, and every single time that you are doing this process, the CPU has to read that location of memory. So it's a location in memory, CPU is accessing that place 10 times. Sometimes the CPU says, wait a minute, why do I have to go through this time consuming thing to go to RAM and pick up the, the stuff from the memory? Yeah, I know you keep telling me to go there. But it's the same memory location. Exactly like that sleep thingy that I have over there. So it's going to say, I'm going to grab that piece and bring it to one of my registers. A register is a piece of extremely fast memory in your, in your CPU. So I'll explain in two seconds. So it brings it in that one, does all the stuff that you have done on the register, and at the end puts that thing back in the memory. So through these hardware optimization, the action and read and write from your memory will actually get ignored. And that happens all the time. Every single time you're reading and writing. And this level of hardware optimization happens <clears throat> in several different levels. What a register is. So um, let's put it this way. I have the lake. I have a barrel. I have a bucket. And I have a teacup. These all carry water, OK? Taking water from lake takes a long time. That's why you bring a barrel. You put a barrel, you cannot. Have you tried to try, ever, ever drink from a barrel? That's embarrassing. Have you ever tried to do so? It's impossible. Don't do it, especially when it's halfway down. You can't do that. It's very dangerous. But anyways, then the bucket comes to the thing. So you fill the bucket. And still heavy to pick up, you pick the, uh, the cup, and you get the water. <clears throat> that big lake that you see over there is your hard drive. <clears throat> the barrel that you see is the cache of your hard drive. Your hard drive has, it says, this, this hard drive has this much cache. Have you heard that? Like it has internal memory of hard drive is bigger. What it does, instead of bringing a big chunk every time, it fills the barrel, brings the information over here, and you read and write it, and then updates that one with the lake. Okay? And then <clears> the <throat> exact same thing happens with 
with u and the computer. The computer gets the chunk of this one and puts it in RAM. RAM is a memory that is fast, but not as much as fast as the internal cache that you have in your uh, CPU. And that internal cache is being read by your register. So internal cache of the CPU is faster than your RAM, and register is faster than your, that, than your uh, cache. And when you look at the amounts, and it exactly resembles an, a, a lake, or you, these days you can call it an ocean. So you're, you have, I don't know, how many terabytes of hard, and then your RAM becomes few gigabytes, right? Or, right? And then after that, <clears throat> your CPU is going to have maybe a meg or two. And your registers, if you have a very good computer, is 64 of them. 64, not 64K. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 64 of them. OK? And it's, that, that's why it's so fast. OK? And that's all the whole. When they say, <clears throat> and this register's width is different. 32 of them. Uh, I think 60. I, 60? Anyways. so. In my childhood, it was 16. And each register's width is actually, they call it fetch width. That's the size of the, they say, my computer is a 32-bit computer. It means the width of the CPU is 32 bits. Each read that it does from the RAM is 32 bits. When you have a 64-bit processor, every, <clears throat> every register size is 64-bit, and that happens. So <clears throat> that was something that I had to mention before multi-threading, and I did it now. So all these things happen to make things faster, and multi-threading is one of those. <clears throat> so how do I make my thread send information back? Because thread cannot return anything. One of the things about thread is that thread is not capable of returning any values. There is no function call. Anywhere. Thread is running foo. Nothing is being returned. All the things that are passed to thread must be void. You cannot return anything from a function in a thread. It is impossible. Okay? In bind, if you wanted to return something through the arguments, remember how we passed the reference to it? You remember that? Ref and the reference. We can do the same thing to the threads, which means in my thread, I can actually do something like this. So say I want to know how many characters I'm printing. So I write something like this. So this will be my, my program that runs. <clears throat> OK? So I, I, that, that's the character that I'm printing. And I'm looping 10 times. And each time I'm printing all the characters in that string. So that's a string coming in, and that string is being printed 10 times. And it's going to return the number of things that it printed. It's some silly thing that I have. Okay, So the value is returned back through this reference. If I want to pass this thing to the thread, <coughs> then it's going to look like something like this. So so. It's going to look like something like this. So when you actually want to pass the thread to actually run it, you have to say ref of tx passed to the foo through the thread. So thread now knows references passed to the thread. And if you don't put the ref, it's not going to do anything to that. You've got to be careful. OK? So now <clears throat> I'm saying over here, uh, this is the string that you're supposed to print. Update the tx for me. This is the string that you're supposed to print, update the ty for me. And this is my main thread, and I'm going to pass it over there. And I'm going to join them, and then I can see how many things are getting printed by each thread. And running that will obviously <clears throat> do something like this. So the first one printed 60, second 120, and the other one, and the main thread 240. You can find that. So are we OK with this? So this is how you return values from your threads.
There is another thing that we need to understand about multi-threading is data racing. What the devil is data racing? Say, <laughs> that wasn't the question. <laughs> that was just to uh, make your brain curious before I. So let's say only we have, we have a lab with only five computers, and we have 40 students. And you want to come and use this the, the thing. It's going to be a race that who's going to get here first. And all the rest has to wait. They have to wait for these five people, to, one of them, to finish so the next one can come in. That's data racing. Okay, and it shouldn't happen. You should make sure that doesn't happen. Sometimes it's going to be a gridlock, and it causes problems. Somebody falls asleep on a computer, and everybody's waiting so, for the thing, but the guy is asleep, right? So therefore, everybody hangs. So data racing is something that we should avoid. And in here, I don't have any data racing because uh, uh, the values that I'm writing are three different ones. But if I pass the reference of the same thing, to all the three threads, what would have happened? They're tr all trying to update. So no one knows what's going to be the value. And if the so if I wanted, like, for example, add to it, if two of them are writing at the same time, what's going to happen? Especially when I have a multi-core uh, uh, computer. That's going to be a problem, right? So <clears throat> we've got to make sure to understand that uh, we take care of those things. So we are going to address that soon. Um, just bear with me. Now, when you are passing threads, passing functions to threads, remember that these threads do not need to be functions. They can be anything, like lambda expressions. So this is the same thing that I'm doing. I'm printing over. So what I'm, what I'm doing over here, I, I, I am uh, uh, printing. Uh, 100 this one, 200 of that one, and 50 of this one. And each one of them are up, are going using TX, TY, and TZ to do so. And therefore, because they are passed by reference, they are updating those values. And I'm joining them all back at the end. So lambda expressions can be passed to threads too. They're, they don't have to be. It can be anything, lambda, functor, whatever you want. And the results are all exactly the same. No difference. OK? That's with lambdas. Let's have a break. I keep forgetting too. Yeah. <laughs> you? All right. So. This one is the same thing. The difference is that I am, uh, this one is the same thing, but I'm checking to see how many things in a second I can print. So now what I have, I have a variable called seconds created over here that gets clock now plus second one, which means from now one second later. So it tells me exactly what is the time one second from now. Then in here I'm going to say, um, start a thread, start from now, and keep looping until now is less than the no, the, less than seconds, which is one second from now. And I'm going to print that one and add to TX++. This will not create any data racing, although they are all dealing with the same variable over here. My three threads over here are are, are, are talking to the same, uh, are uh, reading the same value. The reason is that they are actually reading the same value. Okay, because they are reading the same value, they are not trying to write into it. It's as if you are passing the door of the washroom and you're just looking at the door and passing. There's no problem because you don't want to get in. <laughs> if you want to get, get into the washroom, then whoever reaches faster and opening the door, that's the one who gets it. Okay, so <clears throat> that's that one.
What is important is, what important, what's important is, <clears throat> what if I want to see how many they have uh, read in total? So say I have something like this in here. So I want to have a race between them, and I'm going to allow them to write a thousand characters. And I want to see which one is, uh, uh, like, how, like when they are printing, I want them to stop at a thousand. So a race between them to see how they're going to be able to print a thousand. So the code is, uh, becomes the, uh, uh, changes to this. Now in here, I need to have a counter, some kind of an integer counter, and I'm going to set that counter to zero. The problem is that if I do something like this, what's going to happen? Because they are adding to the value of the counter, I don't know which one is going to do. That is going to call data racing. That's going to cause trouble. There is an internal mechanism that prevents that. So you can create variables, types of any kind that are actually smart enough to have a key, a lock. If somebody gets in to change them, they keep everybody else out. OK? That type of things are called atomic ones. So you can create an atomic integer instead of a regular integer. So you can actually say over here, atomic. int counter is equal to 0. And that solves everything. By creating atomic variables and passing them to uh, threads by reference, the atomic integer by itself locks the entry as soon as somebody comes in and then prevents other people to change them. Yes? Yes? OK, so, so when I run this, now it actually works properly. I can actually go through it, <clears throat> and the, the, the race shows each one uh, wrote how many things. So that's that. Data racing. Not necessarily. What if three of them at the same time, because, because reading, three of them at the same time reach to the value? Right? <laughs> So now, what I want to do over here is to show you how we can control threats to pause if we want to. So by the way, none of these things are going to be in the test. So don't worry about it. Again, these are the things that I told you I'm going to let you know. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not going to go deep into them. So you know, the only thing they're going to be working with is called something called async. But, uh, we'll see. So I'll talk about that one. But what I just want you to, to know they exist. So you have several threads right, running. And you want to be able to control which thread is going to stop now doing something. And the other one's going to continue. And then you tell to the other one, go, and so on and so forth. When you do something like this, you can't. This is not going to work. So this is a bad one. There is no stop and go on this one. Although I think that I'm going to say go and one of them is going to wait for the other one, it won't because this go happens exactly when the thread runs, right? So then an awful way of fixing this, 
problem. is to do something like this. So what you do, you create a character, you're going to say, who goes? Nobody. Right? And it's an atomic one. Right? Then you come over here, you're going to say, the first thread, thread x, I'm going to put a while loop over here. I'm going to say, while who goes is not equal to x, stop, wait for it. Keep looping. And in the other thread, I'm going to do the same thing, right? And I'm going to say go. So it's going to start the thread. Then after it's done, I'm going to say now x go, join. And I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to say y go, and then join. So what happens, I give them, they're kind of waiting for me to run. Writing something like this looks like you're actually telling to your threads to go, but you're screwing up the resources of your computer. As you see, they are uh, completely separate now. But you're screwing up your re the resources of your computer. Why? Because it's not that it, this thread actually paused. Poor thing is running after itself like crazy. Because it's looping there, right? That loop is happening over and over, so it is actually consuming the time of processes of your machine. There is no stopping over there. So creating program logic pauses like that are not really pause. They don't increase the speed. They just give that thread do something useless while other things are doing something useful. And it still re uh, reduces the resources of your, of your uh, uh, system. Uh, to fix this problem, what we have, so this one I'm going to say, is the use of what we call a mutex. You know what a mutex is? Um, have you ever been to a doctor's office? They have this key to the washroom. <laughs> you get the key, you know, the other person is waiting over there, says, wait for the key to come back. You can't. <laughs> so the key comes back, the next person takes it and goes, right? That's what a mutex is. So with a mutex, you can actually lock something and tell, hey, wait. So I'm going to change my code to something like this now. This is the exact same lambda. The difference is that I created the mutex and I called it key, right? And in my thread, I'm saying lock the key when you are coming in, which means that locks the door, which means anybody who wants to lock the key, they can't anymore because the key is locked. They have to wait, right? But this wait is a good wait. It's not like they are in a loop. The thread is standing in a way. OK, so what happens over here is that now <clears throat> I'll go through it and do whatever I want to do. After I'm done, I'm going to unlock the mutex. So it means now I'm out. Someone else can start. And I'll do the same thing to the other one. So key lock, so the exact same thing that I have over here, and they're all, by reference, have access to the same key, right? This one locks the key. I should have called that a door, actually. I called it a key. But it should have been the door, lock the door. Okay? Then I come over here. In my program, I say unlock. As soon as I unlock, they all go. I join them together, but the join that I'll do, whichever comes in quicker, that's going to grab and go. The other one has to wait. So you never know which one is going to come in first. It all depends. So this one is yes. We did. Yeah, yeah, same thing. So it passes an argument, yeah. So this is the same thing. When I do it like this, I'm passing it an argument, right? Yeah, I'll show you that one, too. I'll, we'll come to that one, too. So with this mutex thingy that I have over here, I have three minutes. 
Yeah, so when I run this, that actually locks it and unlocks it. So the mutex's job is to do something like this. As you see, one happens and the other, and then I run it. I want to see if it's going to happen the same way. Seriously? There we go. So, so it changes depending on. Okay? So, yes. Is unlocked. The lock does it. That's the whole thing. It stops right here. Wait, lock, remember, lock is not a regular thing. It's a mutex. So essentially, it waits over here until it unlocks, and then it goes. It locks it, and it goes. And when it finishes, it unlocks so now another person. I should have called this a door, actually. It's better to do it that way. Yes. We don't even use a mutex if you want them all run. Mutex is to control which one is running. So it's possible that you have three different mutexes. And depending on what the process happened, you want to say, I want to do this, then run that thread, and I'll go stop that thread run. So in your program, you can actually lock the uh, different threads as you're going. If you want everything to run parallel, then you don't put a mutex in it. Mutex is to control to have a lock, to stop something before happening and unlock. Many times when you are doing parallel processing, let's say you are doing a search. When the search is complete and you find something, you want to do another parallel thing. So you have 10 threads running. 10 of them are supposed to do search. The other 10 are supposed to do the process. You run them all. You make the mutex of those who are, uh, of, of those who are processing to, to get locked by the search. As soon as the search is complete, the search comes out and uh, sets a flag to true and unlocks the process. And then the processes happen. So this is what mutexes are for, to control which thread is going to run and which one is not. Because it's not threading. It's a process I want to do. I have two different processes. I want process number one to happen and process number two to happen. Process number one locks process number two. Process number one is 50 things running in parallel. Process number two is 50 things running in parallel. Got it? OK. So as soon as one of them is successful, it tells to everyone else, found it, stop, and unlocks the other one. Yes? Exactly. And then when you lock it, you lock everyone else. We have to go. The other class is at a minute. Uh, have a beautiful day, and I'll see you soon. Do, uh, please ask the questions outside, because I get distracted, and, I, uh, that I'm, and I'm going to be late, and the other prop is going to be very angry at me.